Jesus is nailed to a cross. Agony, shame, sacrifice, love. The sinless lamb of God is bearing the sin of the world. The sky turns dark and the earth shakes. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. His head drops to his chest and Jesus breathes his final breath. His body is laid in a borrowed tomb with a boulder and Roman centurions guarding it. But after three days, the angel rolls the stone away and the guards fall to the ground like dead men. And the same Jesus who was crucified, dead, and buried just days before is doing exactly what he promised. Jesus is walking out of the tomb alive. Today we celebrate Jesus as the risen King of Kings and the living Lord of Lords. We proclaim him as the victorious one who has conquered sin and death. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. All glory, all power, all majesty, all dominion are his and his alone. And today we declare together with Christ followers around the world that the resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. Good morning. If you would stand and please worship with us if you're able. We're going to sing about Christ is risen. And give him praise for that. But my to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they lay him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by every soul, Messiah still, and all alone. So it's our voices. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. And all the The sun of heaven rose again. Oh, tremble, death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. We all praise Jesus' name. So praise. Oh. 
if you know how to do this. He is risen. risen Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful to be in your presence with your people. And we are grateful that when we offer worship, when we offer praise, that you are fully worthy. In fact, we fall short with what we offer, and yet you invite us to that, and you inhabit the praises of your people. So we thank you that you have conquered sin and death on the cross and you verified that by raising Jesus from the dead. And you have caused him to ascend and be exalted at your right hand and he will return. We have nothing to fear if we are in him. So we praise you for the gift of life today that we celebrate that Jesus indeed is risen. Receive everything that is due you in this hour. You can be seated for just a moment. I want to welcome you to Allen Bible Church. Happy Easter. Um, we're glad you're here to worship with us. Uh, if you are a guest with us, I want to extend a special welcome to you. If you want, there's a simple card in the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out and drop it in our metal box on the way out the doors, or you can meet one of our welcome team at the um, welcome desk in the lobby. We'd love to meet you and give you a small gift. Uh, one note today, um, in just a moment... Uh, no, not, not just in a moment. They're already dismissed. But up to pre-K and K, uh, there are classes. But first grade and up will remain in here uh, to worship together uh, with your family. So we're glad that you guys are here. As part of your worship, uh, we remind one another to give. Um, if, and often on Easter, people want to give a special gift. If you'd like to do that, you can drop a check in that metal box, as well as these two other ways. You can go to our website right now, or you can text to give. And pretty soon we're going to get savvy and get you a QR code up there where you can have less work to do. But if you've come prepared as part of your worship today, um, that's one way you can do that in contributing. I'm going to ask Lisa Clark to come on up, and she is going to lead us uh, in a congregational call to worship from the historic account of Jesus' resurrection in Mark 
uh, chapter 16, as well as part of Philippians 2. So if you would stand and follow Lisa, and uh, we will call ourselves to worship. The historical record of Jesus' resurrection from Mark, Mark 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, don't be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Jesus laid down his life, taking our place, bearing our sin on that cross. With Jesus laid in the tomb, it seemed like all hope was lost. But he rose, and we gathered this morning to regrip our hope in Jesus, our risen Savior. God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now let us bow our knees and confess together with one voice that this Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, is Lord. Jesus Christ is risen, and he is Lord. Let us exalt his name together.
Jesus, my life, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. Father, we're just grateful that we can sing that, that we can have confidence to come before you because of the life, death, and resurrection of your son, Jesus, that we've been reconciled to you, that we can have right relationship with you, God, because of that sacrifice. And uh, God, I pray that we as just brothers and sisters of Christ and as citizens of your kingdom, God, that we would live a life that brings you honor and glory and uh, that we would share our love with those around us and our neighbors. Father, we thank you for this morning, and we love you, we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Just while I get my stuff. He is risen. And that wasn't just invented by your grandparents. That was a long time ago invented. Well, 
Today we've already heard and rehearsed the historical account of Jesus' resurrection from uh, Mark chapter 2. And now we will see and hear the very first sermon about Easter preached by the Apostle Peter just weeks after Jesus rose from the grave. It's recorded by Luke in Acts chapter 2. Uh, and to set the stage for us, uh, Peter, in this situation on this day, he got a preacher's dream. He did not have to come up with an attention-grabbing open, opening illustration um, because it was given to him. On that day, which the people had been in, they'd come in, into town to celebrate Pentecost, on that day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in power. Uh, there was a lot of um, commotion, if you will, going on, and there was the sound of a rushing wind. And that noise brought together this huge crowd, just like in our day, to see what in the world was going on. And the crowd was stunned when they arrived to hear the apostles speaking about God's mighty works, but not in their own language, but in all these different languages. And travelers had come from all over to be here uh, at that time, and they were stunned because they recognized they were speaking in their language. So everyone in this hyper-attentive audience was asking, what is going on? Everyone was asking that, drawing near, trying to figure it out. But some gave an explanation. Some were actually mocking, saying, these guys are drunk. So, not only is this the very first sermon about Easter and Jesus' resurrection, it may be the only sermon ever where the preacher started off with, no, these people aren't drunk. <laughs> but he says, let me tell you what's happening. And so Peter explains, these men aren't drunk. This is what the prophet Joel prophesied. Joel forecasted these miraculous signs would accompany the beginning of the pouring out of God's Holy Spirit in what they called the last days, or what we call the last days. This is the beginning of that. And these signs that wow you and stun you and perplex you, they mark the beginning of a new era in God's promise of salvation, which also includes final judgment. And so when they understand the last days, God's going to come make things right, but he's also going to come and take account. And so that causes everybody not only to be hyper-attentive because of we're not understanding why you're speaking in our language, now you're talking about this is a sign of God's going to be showing up, and he's already showing up, but it's the beginning of the last days, and that causes everyone to be on high alert. So in verse 21... You don't have to turn there, and well, you can just to get to the next part, but verse 21, Peter ends this first part of his sermon by saying, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. With everyone on alert and going, hey, am I right with God or not? He says, well, let me tell you, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, you won't have to fear. You will be saved. You will be delivered from the wrath of the rightful, just wrath of God on sin. So verse 21 is how he concludes with these encouraging words, whoever or everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, those very words stir questions. Well, how do we know that this Lord is able and trustworthy to save us from God's wrath for our sin? And then really, who is this Lord? And in two words, Peter tells them and us, this Jesus, this Jesus. Um, in the original, this Jesus is in there twice. And the, I'm going to use the ESV today. In the ESV, instead of this man in one of the verses, they also use this Jesus just to say, let's be clear, he's talking about Jesus. So Peter says, this is the beginning of what God promised in his plan of salvation and redemption. So, hey, let's all, yeah, it's good to be alerted to, where am I? Where do I stand with God? How can I ever be in right standing with God? Well, you need to call on the name of the Lord. Who is this Lord? And Peter says, now we're, now we're picking up with him in the middle of his sermon, this Jesus. This Jesus. Meet me there in Acts 2. It'll also be on the screens. Acts 2, recorded by Luke. 
beginning in verse 22. We're going to read through verse 36. Men of Israel, these are all fellow Jews. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, don't miss that, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You've made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. That's uh, Peter quoting several sections of David, Psalms there. Verse 29, he turns his attention to them more directly. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence, and just imagine possibly even pointing down the road, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried. And his tomb is with us to this day, probably pointing in the direction of where his tomb would have been found. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus... God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out that Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing right now. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Lord, help us to see, to hear what you want for us today. Open our eyes, open our hearts. Cause us to be alert and attentive to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So Peter, in two words, says, well, who is this Lord that we're to call on to be saved? Well, he's this Jesus. And a simple framework for this morning is he's this Jesus who was crucified or who died, this Jesus who was raised, and this Jesus who is the exalted, risen and exalted Lord and Christ. He was crucified, he was raised, and he is now exalted. First of all, the fact that he was crucified. Verses 22 and 23, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This Jesus was crucified, and I have underneath on the the title slide there. Um, His death was not an accident. Jesus' death was not an accident. Peter says, God attested to him. And and he says, he adds the phrase, you yourselves know. This is only a a few weeks from when Jesus had been living. And during that time, it says he attested by these signs and wonders that he did through Jesus, all pointing to There's something about him that's not just human. Oh, he's fully human. But as we would know, he's also God in the flesh, fully God and fully human. And God wanted to attest to that. He wanted that to be verifiable by seeing. And the the religious leaders who rejected Jesus even said, no one can do this except God. No one can say that except God. That's why they wanted to kill him. They're like, you can't be God. But, but God attested to him in his life, through his miracles, through his teaching, yes, but particularly speaking of here, through his miracles, to authenticate him as the one God had promised he would send, his Messiah, or in the Greek, his Christ, the anointed one of God. God attested 
to him, this one who walked on, wa- walked on water or took water and made wine, who fed 5,000, who raised Lazarus only weeks before this from the dead. But he says this was not an accident. He says he was delivered up by the purposed plan of God or the definite plan of God. This wasn't God going, ah, we fumbled that. You were here Friday night. We talked about fumbling. God didn't go, oh, man, now how do, what do I do? This was part of his definite plan all along. Isaiah 53, 10, talking about the suffering servant. First of all, that the Messiah would suffer was a mystery to them. And then the fact that he would die, and it says in verse 10, but he was pleased to crush him. The word pleased there isn't like God took great delight in, like, I couldn't wait to do this. It has to do with his will. He willed that he would be crushed for our sins, that he would be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our sins, and that the chastening that we deserve would fall on him rather than us. It's by his wounds that you and I are healed, and that was part of God's plan. But it also, yes, was still the responsibility of those who rejected and put him on that cross, both the Jewish leaders and their rejection as well as, he says, the, hand, uh, the hands of wicked men. It literally means lawless, which probably refers to both the Jews acting lawless as well as those who didn't have the law, the Romans who crucified him. He said Jesus' death was not an accident. But I want us to see this from the very words of Jesus himself. This wasn't just an accident because it was part of God's plan. Jesus told his disciples over and over and over again. I just want us to see three Times in Mark, we were in Mark's gospel earlier. Mark 8, Mark 8, 31. This is right after he says, Well, who, you know, who do people say that I am? Well, you might be one of the prophets. We don't know. He said, Who do you say that I am? Peter says, You're the Christ, the, the Son of God. And he says, Hey, that's right. And then remember, Peter then um, has to be rebuked. Why? Well, because right after he says, You're the Christ, you're the Son of God, you're God's chosen one, Jesus says, That's right. He began to teach them that the Son of Man, talking of himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And Peter says, no way. That's when he calls Peter. Uh, He says, get behind me, Satan. You're setting your interest on man's, which a suffering Messiah doesn't fit your categories. That's not what you're about. You want to be at my right and left to be in a place of power and authority. He says, you're you're setting your mind, your agenda um, in front of God's. He said, this is God's agenda. In Luke's vocabulary, who writes Acts, he calls it the, uh, he doesn't call it this, but it's divine necessity. It must happen. Second one in Mark, Mark 9. He was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered in the hands of men. They will kill him. When he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Next one, chapter 10. This is right before he's going to move, uh, go into Jerusalem. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. Notice he includes there, the, at the hands of men he will die. But I want you to see, Jesus does not mix words. He calls his shot. He points out to left field, and he says, that's where it's going. And then he gets up to bat, and he swings, and it's gone. That's very important. This wasn't Jesus going, oh, man, how did I get in this situation? He says, this is the situation we are going to Jerusalem for. So don't miss that. This was not an accident. It was part of the plan of God. Not only was Jesus' death not an accident, but also the next section, death could not hold him. This Jesus, God raised. This Jesus was raised because death could not hold him. Verses 24 to 31, verse 24, God raised him up. Some of your translations say, but God raised him up. That's good because he's saying, hey, God planned this and and men um, made this happen on the cross. His death but God. So like, hey, don't think God was asleep at the wheel. God did, God raised him up. But actually in the original, there's no like kind of division between 23 and 24. It's really whom God raised up. You crucified him. 
whom God raised up. God's answer to the rejection, his um, reversal of their judgment on uh, Jesus isn't the Messiah we want. He's the one whom God raised up. And what does he do? Verse 24, loosing the pangs of death. Why? Because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Not only was his death not an, not an accident, death could not hold him. Death is a defeated enemy. This Jesus, God raised him up, and he loosed the pangs of death. Some of your translations say the agony of death. It's not bad because there's a lot of ang agony involved with death. If you've lost a loved one, there's agony, there's anguish, there's grief. Death is horrible. So that is true. But particularly, the word used here is one um, where it would be associated with birth pangs. Picture a pregnant woman in her ninth month, and those pangs come. And he says, he has loosed those. He has loosed the pangs of death. We typically think pangs equal birth. And he's saying he's associating pangs with death. What that gives us a picture of is Jesus dying and going to the tomb. That as he died, that defeated death or took care of and loosed from um, himself and for us the pangs of death so that the tomb is actually a womb. The tomb is a womb. Yes, he died in order to get to that tomb, but it's, he's using pangs of death to say, but it's that very place where the, the new life, the new creation, that he can be the firstborn of the new creation, firstborn from the dead, Therefore, we can know if we follow him in faith, that same resurrection will be ours. Because the tomb for him is a womb to give birth to the new life that is possible for you and for me. So death could not hold him, he says, also because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Again, using the image, I have been, Peter's talking about we've been witnesses of this resurrection. I have personally been witness of the birth pangs. At some point, you can't stop what they're doing. That the pangs will, will apply and life will come out. And I have seen those pangs be four and a half hours long. And I have seen those pangs be nine minutes long in a delivery. But that baby's coming out. And he's saying that's the same deal. Because of his indestructible life, the author of the Hebrews says it's impossible for Jesus to be held in the grip of death because he conquered and defeated it and the grave the womb was a tomb and he could not be stopped I want you to see this in Hebrews 2 this this is uh, speaking of Jesus partook of um, flesh he became fully human while still maintaining full deity but he had to do so in order that he could be our substitute our place taker in order that he could be the one who could stand in my place and yours on that cross and die. He says this, the author of the Hebrews says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death, so he had to die, through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus, through his death, canceled that power that the devil has. He's a defeat, death is a defeated enemy, and he might free us. Uh, if you were here on Friday night, many of us, we celebrate Jesus died and Jesus rose, but many of us live our lives if, as if he's still in the tomb. He says, We've been freed from that kind of existing. It's not living, it's existing. We've been freed from the panic and the scatter shooting life and the, and the, and the anxious ridden life that really it's death behind those things because that's the ultimate ghost, if you will, that we're afraid of. Death, what do I do with death? I know it's coming I got my life all together right now. I'm as healthy as I can be, et cetera, et cetera, because I'm trying to stave off death. And he's saying, we don't have to live afraid of death. 
because it couldn't hold him. And if we are in him, just like that tomb was a womb for him to new life, if we are in him, we have a life that um, will hold. Death can't hold us. And so he says, in fact, uh, I would say this, I'll say it again at the end. If Jesus can do nothing about death, then whatever else he can do amounts to nothing. But then he says in verse 25, and we're not going to spend much time at all on this, verse 25, he quotes David um, th from three Psalms of David. He says, for David says, he says, listen, David looking forward, knowing that the Messiah would come um, from his line, he says, I looked forward, and he says, David foresaw this. He quotes three Psalms to show that this Jesus is the Christ whom David foresaw, would be resurrected. And the point of these three psalms is David is not the ultimate one. That he's talking and forecasting and looking forward to someone else. And then Peter, very brilliantly, not only did he have the noise and stuff to kind of get everybody's attention and people saying he's drunk, so he's got his opening illustration, but now he can point down the street and say, David looked forward to this descendant of his who would be the promised one a davidic king who would sit on his throne forever and we can go visit his tomb right now david is dead jesus is risen because he's not only crucified but he's raised and death could not hold him because death is a defeated enemy and it vindicated jesus as he was raised and so not only is he crucified and raised but jesus is exalted he is named both Lord and Christ. Verse 32, Peter says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. In fact, Paul names several witnesses and says, If you want to find out, Jesus appeared at one time to over 500. They're still alive. So go talk to them. We like to, as moderns, we like to think back and go, Oh, well, they were just kind of all deluded. They could have easily squashed it. They could have produced a body. They could have gone and talked to Josiah or, you know, Nathaniel or whoever down the street, <laughs> one of those 500. But those eyewitnesses, Peter says, we are eyewitnesses of that. It's what Jesus told them before he ascended. You shall be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Guess what's happening today? The Holy Spirit has come upon them. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Not only do you belong to me and your hope and your living hope you have is because I'm raised and you will walk in that newness of life and you will be with me forever, but you also have a purpose today and a meaning in life, not just to live for yourself, not just to try to stave off death, not just to try to appear like you've got life all together so everybody else is jealous of you, but you have a life to be my witnesses or as we say around here, my ambassadors among your neighbors, your coworkers to say this Jesus, this Jesus was crucified. It wasn't an accident. This Jesus, God raised him up and he is exalted. He says, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus ascended and they saw that. They were witnesses of that. And now that he's at God's right hand, uh, verse 34, David didn't ascend to the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And God the Father says, now you can give the Spirit. You can give out the benefits of salvation in your name, which is forgiveness of sins and eternal life, which we can know when we have trusted Jesus, his Spirit indwells us. And so Jesus is now, for the beginnings of that, he's pouring out the Spirit seated in a place of authority and honor at the right hand. Hebrews 1.3, there's a slide. Speaking of Jesus being supreme, that's what Hebrews is all about, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And he says, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, meaning if you want to see God, look at Jesus. And he upholds all things by the very word of his power. And when he had made purification of sins, when he died on the cross, and then he rose... He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You only sit at the right hand if you've been invited to. It's a place of honor. It's a place of authority. And Jesus has been given that because, verse 36, this, all that has happened according to God's plan, 
is to show that this Jesus whom God raised, he also ascended, and now he is exalted in that place of honor and authority. And God has, it says, made him both Lord and Christ. What I want you to think of is a show a couple years ago called Undercover Boss. Undercover Boss was, you know, the CEO of some large company goes to work in one of the factories of the, you know, where probably a CEO, you didn't know anybody's name, probably not even the regional manager or the assistant to the regional manager. You didn't know them. And the, the boss would disguise uh, him or herself and go in and just start, you know, making widgets or whatever and go through the, just the grind, right? And what does that do? It builds empathy. Um, but then at the very end, right, there's the reveal, like, and then the employee who was like bad mouthing, you know, the higher ups, like, oh, whoops. But the whole point there was he wasn't made boss or she wasn't made CEO. They already were that. And Jesus is that. He's revealed as Lord and Christ. He's revealed as or shown to be by his obedience even unto death on a cross, by his being buried in a tomb, by his resurrection, by his appearances, by his ascension, and now by his exalting. He's being revealed as I was the boss undercover. I was God in the flesh. And if you've seen me, you've seen God. And I am the resurrection and the life. Romans 1, 4, Paul says this way. He says about Jesus, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's saying, because God raised him from the dead, that is the ultimate exclamation point, vindication. He is Lord. He's saying he's God. And he's saying he's God's chosen one to bring about his plan of salvation for all who would call upon the name of the Lord, and that Lord is Jesus, and only Jesus. So whoever calls on the name of the Lord in verse 21 will be saved. Saved from what? Well, from sin's penalty. Now, a lot of us may not, or some of us may not like to use the word sin. We may say, I don't know if I believe in that, but every one of us knows. We walk through each week especially if you get on the outrage of the day or the outrage of the half day on Twitter or whatever it is, the very fact that we have outrage means we, have, we feel like there's some standard being violated. So the question isn't, is there some sense that we even we're like, oh, there's no absolute truth except for the absolute truth that I'm telling you there's none. But, but we do know down in our gut, something's not quite like it's supposed to be. The Bible would call that sin. The Bible would say, God, in his perf perfection and holiness, we have ruptured a, a ruptured relationship because we uh, had sin, Adam's sin imputed to us, and we live with sin, but we also sin. And so because of that, that's, things aren't the way it's supposed to be. We're also part of that. And when he was put to death at the hands of godless men, yes, they sinned against him. But he also took our sin on himself at that time. And so it was also my sin and yours that put him there along with God being pleased to crush him. So we have to call on him so that he can save us from sin's penalty, which is death, which biblically means spiritual separation from God for eternity. So call in the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Who is this Lord? This Jesus was crucified raised, ascended, and exalted as Lord and Christ. To call on him is to believe in him. Now, the people who originally heard this, if you peek down to verse 37, they say, what shall we do? They were pierced to the heart. What shall we do? And he uses a language there of saying, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Repent means I'm going one way and I'm thinking one way about Jesus. For them, it was as a nation they had rejected him. Like, we don't think you're Messiah. He says, no, he is Lord in Christ. So you need to change your thinking, which also means change of direction in life. To be baptized is to identify with him. So yes, they probably were dunked at some point, um, but baptism literally means identification. Identify that you are a sinner and have the need of someone to save you. And now I'm beginning to understand that I need to identify and call on you, trust in you and you alone, because I can't pay for my sin. I can't clean up my life. And that's what the invitation is. And so 
to, to kind of wrap up the meaning of the resurrection. There's so much that we could go through. But those who were there that day when Peter preached or those who had heard reports soon after Jesus um, rose, they knew. They knew that if it's true that Jesus rose from the dead, they knew it meant, well, we can no longer just pick and choose how we want to live. And if he's Lord and Christ and he rose from the dead, we also have to understand and realize that he probably gets to call the shots because he called the shots and then fulfilled them. And he's conquered death. And so he must be the author of life. And so everything then in our lives should be under his rule and authority. God's exalted him to that place. It's just time for me to align myself with that. Tim Keller says this. Let me say this one thing. Since Jesus called his shot that he would die and rise, it changes everything. It tells us if he said that and then he did that, you can take him at his word. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When he's talking to his disciples and they say, well, where are you going to go? And he's like, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And he's going to prepare a place for you. If he says... You know, believe in me, and even if you die, you will live. You can take him at his word. If he says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. You can take him at his word. And, and, and some of us are, are, are believers, been believers, for, but, but we've, we've almost grown numb in just trying to get through a day. And that heavy ladenness, we're not taking him at his word. The invitation isn't one like, you come here and I'll figure out how to straighten you out. It's like, I get it. You're exhausted and you're exhausting yourself. Come to me with your whole heart. I will give you rest. Tim Keller says this. I use this almost every Easter because it's like, this is almost Bible. Uh, <laughs> but he says, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said. In other words, like you want to say, well, I believe Jesus is a good teacher, but I don't know about this. He says, if he didn't rise from the dead, then then don't even worry about that he was a good teacher. This isn't about getting life hacks from a guy who wore robes and sandals. He says, the issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. That's That's what's here. John 11 This is Jesus talking to Martha right before he raises Lazarus. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? What I'm telling you is he's worthy of you trusting him because he said he would die and he said he would rise. And he did. And there's an empty tomb and there are eyewitnesses. Death couldn't hold him, but his word held because he rose and conquered that grave. So take him in, or as Keller, you know, off of his quote there, take him in, take him out, but don't take him lightly and don't dismiss him. Do you, will you believe? Will you today? Yeah, you're like, yeah, I know what he's going to talk about. Jesus died and rose. But, but will you today hear him calling you? You're one of the everyone who I'm saying, call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. I want you, God wants you to know that rest, the ultimate rest, that, that death is taken care of, that life will then have meaning. And I don't have to put on airs anymore. And I don't have to be afraid anymore. He would invite you He's the Lord of life. Believe in him. It simply, it simply means put the weight of your life on Jesus and what he's done, taking your place and mine on the cross. Not you get, getting yourself put together. It can't happen. But also it couldn't happen that death could hold him because he's Lord in Christ. Because if Jesus can do nothing about death, then whatever else he does or says amounts to nothing. But it couldn't hold him, and it won't hold you if you have believed in him. So my question to you, especially if you're already a believer, what do you have to be afraid of? He loosed the pangs of death. He 
he, he canceled the power that death can have over us. What do you have to be afraid of? Death is a defeated enemy. Since Jesus rose, it means we don't have to be afraid of anything. Not being canceled, not cancer, not a rejection letter from a college or a job application or an interview, not a breakup, not an economic downturn, not your past being exposed, not your incompetence being found out, or your future being unknown. You don't have to be anxious or afraid of being unemployed, of being unnoticed, your disease being untreatable, or even death itself, because Jesus rose. He is the resurrection and the life. Lastly, I just want you to be encouraged by a living example, I mean living at that moment. Who's the speaker of this sermon? Peter, the one who said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. The one who said, no, no, Jesus, that's not how it's going to happen. He says, get behind me, Satan. The one who bragged at the, la- the Last Supper when Jesus said, all oh, you guys are going to fall away. He goes, I'll never fall away from you. And he said, well, I've prayed for you. And kind of once that happens, I pray that you'll, you'll return and strengthen your brothers. The one who then did deny Jesus, knowing him or any association with him, in front of a little girl in a fire outside of the trials going on. Three times, Jesus said, you'll deny me before the rooster crows. And he did. And Jesus turned his gaze to him. Not to guilt him where he just, you know, is completely, that's it, you're sealed. But to say, remember? But then also, he said, I want you to strengthen your brothers when you've returned. And Jesus made that happen when he brought him uh, breakfast on the beach. And he says, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Lord, do you love me? You know I do. Tend my lambs. Jesus restored him. He denied him three times. Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? And then Peter, who was denying in front of the little girl by the fire, the next uh, two chapters later in Acts, he and John are arrested for speaking in the name of Jesus, saying that's the only name by which we can be saved. They're arrested. They're threatened. And they said, listen, you can do whatever you want, But as for us, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. That's a boldness of a person who's no longer afraid to die because they're so enthralled to live. And they're so enthralled with the life of Christ in them. So if God can take a person who always stuck his foot in his mouth, who who time after time after time couldn't come through, and who cratered at times, and who was fearful at times, if God can do something with him to where he's the one who stands up and says, these men aren't drunk, let me tell you. It's about this Jesus whom God raised. Then think what he would do. Imagine what he could do with you as his ambassador in the place where he has you. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Would you bow your heads? Just quoting Peter as our prayer here. 1 Peter 1, 3. And I could just hear Peter's pace pick up in this. I can hear and see him just discoursing through him, thinking about his life and all the times that he failed and blew it, and yet Jesus, faithful and faithful and faithful, to be patient and to restore him and say, I got things for you. I got plans for you. I got steadiness for you so that you'll live like a rock. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Lord, that is our prayer, that you would be blessed, you would be honored, that you would have our hearts turned toward you right now. I pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know Jesus, has never trusted him personally, that they would hear you inviting them specifically, that this is a day that marks a beginning in their life where they've come to see that maybe they thought they kind of had this figured out or they would figure it out later. You're saying today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to turn to trust Jesus who is Lord and Christ and King of Kings. 
Jesus, in Jesus' name. Would you stand? We're going to sing of him, and then I'll bring a benediction. things this week even uh, to invite you to this Wednesday we have our midweek ministries for kids up to students but also adults we're beginning a new five-week deal if you're like I'm, I'm wondering about this following Jesus thing we're going to go through five weeks of the uh, John 13 through 17 where Jesus talks about here's what matters most to me for my followers this would be a great jump in point if that's you um, I just invite you to come to that and then next Sunday we um, will begin uh, looking through Colossians, um, what it looks like to have a life hidden with God in Christ because he's raised from the dead. So what does this resurrection life look like? Invite you to join us next Sunday for that. And um, I would encourage you, if you've trusted Christ today, or if you've prayed a prayer, if you're like, I'm in that anxious, afraid moment, and I just need somebody to pray, I'm gonna stand up here. You, you come up, I'll, actually I'll be down here, so it won't be as obvious. Come up. I would love to know that, celebrate that with you. love to pray with you um, in that regard. Here's our benediction, and we're dismissed. Romans 15. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Happy Easter. Have a great week.